Gabrielle Langholtz at the end is the editor. She's also the editor of Edible Brooklyn. She's taught in the NYU Food Studies Department and for five years has managed publicity for Green Market, the nation's largest network of farmers markets. Brian Howell in the middle is the executive editor and he's been at the forefront of the growing Eat Local movement. In 1997, he joined World Watch Institute as a senior researcher and John Gardner Public Service Fellow. At the Institute, Brian writes on social and ecological impacts of how we grow food, focusing recently on orga organic farming, biotechnology, hunger, and rural communities. He describes the evolving local food movement in his recent book, Eat Here, Reclaiming Homegrown Pleasures in a Global Supermarket. Brian's work has also been featured in the international press, and he has testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations on the role of biotechnology in combating poverty and hunger in the developing world. He's traveled throughout Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, and East Africa, learning indigenous farming techniques and promoting sustainable food production. He also works on Edible East and, um, and Edible Brooklyn. And then at the end here is Michael Harlan Turkel, who's the photo editor. He's a freelance photographer and free time cook who used to work in restaurants, but now photographs the inner workings of kitchens for his back of the house project. And he'll talk a little bit more about that later. His work was recently published in 25 Under 25 Up and Coming American Photographers. Um, and please welcome Brian, Gabrielle, and Michael. Um, do, I, do I need to go to the podium? No. Uh, Whatever you like. Okay. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. We have been so thrilled by the response to our launch issue. Um, actually, I'm just curious. How many people knew, how many people saw the magazine before tonight? So maybe more like two-thirds something. Terrific. Um, well, uh, as Lewis said, our launch issue um, hit in September. Um, Edible Brooklyn is two and a half years old, and Edible... East End is uh, four years four old, years old. Um, but we're thrilled to um, have made it to Manhattan. So I'm going to read just a little bit from my opening letter to the editor. Um, for those of you who don't, letter to the editor, sorry, letter from the editor. <laughs> I wrote myself a letter. Um, for those of you who don't know the magazine, it sort of introduces it a little bit. Start spreading the news. The edible family of magazines has made it to Manhattan. Oh, I think I drank out of that one. Sorry. Um, it's harvest season in the tri-state region, and you hold in your hands the first picking of a crop that's already blossomed across the nation, upstate, out on the island, and just over the Brooklyn Bridge. Like the American food renaissance it celebrates, the first edible sprouted in California, heralding the homegrown flavors of a surf town called Ojai. When Sever Magazine knighted the little lip-smacking newsletter as one of its favorite things in America, something remarkable began. Across the country, from Boston to Austin, and from the Front Range to the Finger Lakes, people who care about real food got inspired to publish collections of love letters to place-based taste, which you already heard. New Yorkers aren't used to going without, and as of today, we won't have to anymore. Each issue of Edible Manhattan will pull back the curtain on our city's eats to reveal every spellbinding, unctuous tale in town. It's a grassroots publication we believe will sate a hunger, a hunger left by the gastro glossies. And I go on to talk a little bit more about what's in our launch issue and um, what type of content will um, will go on to deliver. So, um, do you want me to talk a little bit about the, the overall scope? Yeah, that'd be great. So, um, in a way, I sort of define um, edible probably the wrong way to go about it, but I, I kind of define us as what we're not. And you talked a little bit about that. Um, I am addicted to food journalism, and I love all the blogs, and I love all of the snarky and the, um, the trend watching, but that's really not what this magazine is about um, or about any of the edibles, not what any of the edibles is about. We're about... Um, authentic experiences about passionate people who seek out um, real ingredients or real processes. Um, it, within Brooklyn and Manhattan, which I edit, um, 
I break it down as we cover our pre-industrial past, in other words, you know, what the Lenape ate, um, our industrial past, things like um, the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn, the Sweet and Low Factory, um, when Chelsea Market was, um, real, you know, w when there was true industry happening uh, in 19th century New York and in the 20th century and some still today. Um, the heyday foods of New York, things like the hot dog, the cheesecake. Um, in our launch issue, we have a, um, a story about our namesake cocktail, the Manhattan in Edible Brooklyn, we had a story about the Brooklyn, which is sort of the, the borough proud answer to the Manhattan. Um, we talk about really terrific ethnic eats, um, like urging New Yorkers to go outside of your little path that you're used to and ride the R train all the way to the end, go to Sunset Park, go to Koreatown, you know, experience. Um, there, you don't need a passport to travel the world and have to taste the flavors of, of our globe. It's all right here, or a lot of it is right here in New York City. Um, we do talk some about um, great restaurants, but that's really just a small slice of what we cover. And we particularly seek out, um, if, a, if a restaurant is, is glamorous, that in itself is not of interest to us, but if they're really seeking out good ingredients, um, forming relationships with farmers, you know, illegally curing their own bacon on the fire escape. That's what's interesting to us. Um, and of course, um, farmers markets, community gardens, and um, in, our, in our backyard, which I put in quotes, um, the producers right in our backyard, so reminding New Yorkers about seasonality. And um, a couple other things too, but those are the, those are the big main themes. So some of the content um, that you'll see in Edible Manhattan some of the content that I assign is similar to what you might read in other magazines, but it's, it's exclusive in its focus. I guess not so much in other magazines, but more the dining section of the Times would have some overlap with our content. Um, but we are exclusively about New York City. You will not read about um, simply straight about cooking unless it has a specific Manhattan angle. You won't read about, you know, a great bunch of trends in Aspen, Colorado. Um, we are for buying of uh, New York City. And we really encourage our readers to, um, to seek out that rich experience and to uh, patronize them. And, and um, it, only through that patronage will, will these foods continue to thrive in a global environment of, of sameness and chains. So we feel really lucky in New York to um, to have these, this vibrant food culture, and um, and we're here to to champion it and um, encourage people to defend it and add to it. Great. Should I keep going? Okay, great. And um, and Brian, as Lewis said, is um, the publisher of Edible Manhattan and Edible Brooklyn, and the editor of Edible East End, a mastermind, and um, he's also a contributor to Edible Manhattan. Um, which my, he's my secret weapon writer, and he wrote a. Um, really incredible piece, in my opinion, in our launch issue about tap water. So I'd like to read from that. Thank you. Um, I was going to read from that, but I think I'm going to just say a little more intro before I do. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I think, a great um, welcoming to Edible Manhattan and Edible Brooklyn and the whole network. I'll give you a little more background. Um, Edible Ojai was the very first Edible magazine. It was founded about six years ago. Ojai is this tiny little quirky town north of Los Angeles. It was founded by these two women, uh, Carol Tapalian and Tracy Ryder, one a uh, fine arts photographer, uh, the other a graphic designer, who wanted to put together a publication to celebrate uh, all of the food and wine people in their community. They did it as a sort of hobby project. They, print, they printed 6,000 of them. And even in this little town with 2,000 residents, the magazines disappeared immediately. Uh, an editor of Savoir magazine got their hand, as Gabrielle says in the intro, um, got their hand on it and said, this is a publication that belongs in every community in the United States. Uh, they were at the forefront of the interest in eating local and using food as a way to get more connected to your neighbors, to your landscape, to environmental concerns, uh, to food that just tastes better and has better history. And shortly after, they started getting contacted by people all over the country saying, we want to start an edible magazine where we are. They quickly formed a corporation. It's not a franchise. It's more of a network. Uh, there is a buy-in fee to, uh, to um, 
become part of that network and share the mission, and you're provided with a template and all sorts of other assistance, uh, sort of 101 on publishing. And all of the magazines, regardless of where they are, whether it's Portland, Oregon or Portland, Maine, share this mission of celebrating their local food community. So all the content is local. Most of the advertising uh, is also local. Uh, And they're independently owned, and they all have their own sort of distinct flavor. They look very similar. You'll see a lot of similar fonts used, and the layout is similar, but they all uh, are place-based. I learned about Edible Ojai when I was working on a book about the local food movement in America. Uh, Tracy and Carol uh, impressed me immediately. I was uh, uh, blown away by this idea that they had. And when they were wondering about... Uh, expansion into New York, they asked if I'd be interested in uh, starting one on the east end of Long Island, which is where I live. And uh, my neighbor and friend, Stephen Munchen, who's also the publisher, was getting out of his business. He had a lot of uh, business experience that I didn't have. He had a lot of graphic design experience that I didn't have. So as a food journalist, uh, matched with someone with more business experience, it was a great combination. We launched Edible East End four years ago, had a very flattering response telling the story of the farmers and fishers and winemakers on the east end of Long Island. A couple years later, uh, some friends in Brooklyn who had seen Edible East End uh, said, you need to do a magazine here. We were put in touch with Gabrielle, who um, is our sort of, uh, who with, without whom we couldn't do either of these two magazines. Uh, because she's so well-connected in the food world, because she has a writing background, uh, and because of who she knows. And uh, we launched Edible Brooklyn, which has very quickly became a type of cult magazine. It was very hard to find, uh, no matter how many we printed. And uh, finally, we got uh, got the uh, staff and support together, including uh, Michael, who uh, joined Edible Brooklyn a few issues in and quickly became the person who we needed to take our photos and still takes the majority of the photos for both magazines and commissions uh, and finds the others. And uh, we launched Edible Manhattan a couple of months ago. And, uh, you know, it's it's just starting out, of course. It's a new business. But we've already had a very nice response. And uh, to give you a bit more background on the business model, these are advertising-driven magazines. They are given out for free, for the most part, everywhere around the country. We do sell Edible Manhattan at places like Whole Foods and Kitchen Arts and Letters and places where you find magazines. Uh, But right now, it's still a mixed distribution model. And we generate a buzz and uh, generate, I suppose, if you can intentionally, that cult status, that feeling that people want to find it and they might find it here, they may not find it there, by not just selling it and offering it by subscription, which is also a stream of revenue for us, but by distributing it at like-minded restaurants and wine shops and farmer's markets and doing gorilla drops in front of the Union Union, uh, Square subway station, uh, and people find the magazine that way. They tell their friends about it. And, um, and, and as a result, we, we develop this readership. Um, and people interested in picking up the magazine, because as Gabrielle says so eloquently, it peels back the curtain on where your food comes from. And um, in the context of, uh, of talking about writing and journalism, we want people to read more about food. I mean, we want people to spend more time reading about food because we have the sense that when they know more of the backstory, again, not just whether this new restaurant is good or not, but and not just whether the clams are rubbery, but where those clams came from, and they got them off uh, from from a clam farmer in the Peconic Bay because the sous chef grew up on Long Island and knows that farmer, and they have a secret connection with that person. And in fact, there's a lot of Long Island seafood uh, sold at the restaurant. Uh, and uh, because of that same heritage, uh, they have a whole other take on hospitality and food traditions. And so, again, we're, we're interested in getting you, the reader, concerned about every intimate detail uh, about that food. Uh, we think that it will allow you to appreciate it more, understand it more, and actually enjoy it more. So this is not uh, you know, solely an academic uh, uh, pursuit. It's, it's something... We celebrate great food that makes you happy. Authentic eating experiences is another um, phrase that we use a lot. And a good example in this launch issue is the story about the donut plant, which has an amazing photo essay by by Michael. And we don't necessarily think of donuts as a sustainable food, right? I mean, this is not a healthy food necessarily, uh, but it is a necessary food even if it's, you know, consumed in you know, small quantities. And this guy at the donut plant is doing an, a, a very unique, amazing thing that's worth telling, including having donut plants that he supervises 
in Tokyo subway stations because a Japanese investor a few years ago said these are the most amazing donuts. They need to be in Tokyo. So uh, you can visit them on Delancey and Grand Street, mm -hmm. um, and you can also get them in Tokyo. So, you know, we decided to write about Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, and this is something that makes us a bit different than the other magazines because these are also where a lot of food trends for America begin and get translated. So that's why we have more stories to, to draw from. Uh, but these magazines seem to thrive wherever they pop up, small towns, big cities, red states, blue states, and um, it's because everyone is, is interested uh, in connecting with their food a little bit more. And, um, you know, if there's anything that makes our writing different, it's that, as Gabrielle said, it's all place-based. So we don't struggle to find something concrete uh, for, the, for the reader to, to get attached to. And I'll just read the, the beginning of this uh, story on tap water. The Champagne of Tap. I had a childhood friend whose father swore by New York City tap water. He kept glass bottles of tap in the fridge, and it was all he drank, save for a nightly cocktail on his balcony overlooking Carl Schur's Park, or the Heineken he cradled, cradled while watching the Yankees on television. If the water ran brown with bits of iron oxide, as often happens after city workers service a water main, he chalked it up to diligent municipal upkeep and let it run clear. When New Yorkers, including his wife, started cramming fridges with Perrier, he declared, New York water is the best in the world. It's the only thing that tastes right to me. Such strong hydrological opinions aren't uncommon among New Yorkers, but he was ahead of his time. Today, today's eco-gastronomes forego the bottle for the faucet. They're joined in hydro-solidarity with the Delaware County farmer who keeps his cows out of nearby streams, the midtown chef who buys his cheese, and the Manhattan school kid blogging about drinking fountains. Despite his primal allegiance to tap, from his Upper East Side perch, my friend's father couldn't have fathomed the much-heralded, highly complicated, and endlessly elegant system of reservoirs, aqueducts, and 30-foot-wide cast-iron pipes that delivers the water that daily quenches the 8 million residents of New York City. Even for biophobic New Yorkers who consider a walk in the park the preeminent nature hike, the water in our tap may be our most intimate connection to our landscape. Like some massive God-given Brita filter covering 2,000 square miles on both sides of the Hudson River, the oak and pine forests, the clover-laden pastures, the organic vegetable farms, the muddy swamps, and all the other green space in the watershed provide New York City with one of the purest, most abundant supplies of drinking water of any metropolis on Earth. So again, we try to put things in the bigger context. And, um, <clears throat> and um, I, I'm grateful to say that a lot of people uh, who I know, who I consider uh, you know, very well-read and um, thoughtful and conscientious New Yorkers uh, told me about that story and about many other stories in this issue that they didn't know, that they didn't know this story. So um, we are in the business. We're a magazine with a mission, and we're in the business of educating people about where their food comes from, uh, however we can do it, with compelling photography and good writing. Um, I don't have anything to read because I mainly take photos. Um, but I kind of got involved um, initially with what I do, uh, documenting kitchens and chefs, um, for a project in college in 2001. I was actually cooking at the time. i um, been in kitchen since I was 15. thought I wanted to be a chef, and my parents said that that was not allowed until I got a degree. So I went to school for uh, liberal arts and mathematics, hated it, actually started moonlighting as a cook, didn't tell them that I had dropped out, then had to come back to New York because I ran out of money. Um, went back to school, found photography, cooked my way through school again, moved back to Boston, and try to do a frenetic 80, 90 hour work week, going to college and cooking at the same time. And at some crazy hectic point, the two things kind of meshed uh, and these two passions of photography and food amalgamated. Um, I think it was when I was trying to remember all my prep work, mise en place and plating, I started taking photos because I had a documentary assignment and um, started putting them up on the wall so I'd know how to do everything the next day uh, you know, uh, in the kitchen. And one of my friends said, oh, you should keep on doing that for your project. And this is uh, what, about seven, eight years later, and I haven't stopped. So um, knock on wood, kind of lucky that I got to be able to incorporate those two things. Um, I just was very extraordinarily happy uh, a couple years ago when I saw that Edible Brooklyn had popped up. Um, I live in South Brooklyn, and 
I had been photographing in kitchens of uh, many chefs here and following them with no real like endpoint in sight yet. Uh, just have wanted to archive and kind of document all this, feeling that there was a reason to show it eventually. Um, and th this forum, you know, showed up, and it was just the the, the perfect place to actually preview the work. Um, and What's so incredible about it is that I, I never really liked doing event photography. Um, a lot of celebrity has come to the world of food and chefs, and you, you saw the Food and Wine Festival that just happened last week, and Sweets, etc., and Top Chef, and um, this was never something I wanted to do in jostle for space or jostle for attention with these people. All these stories are so one-on-one -on -one, um, with the writer, with the photographer, um, that we get to experience this firsthand. I think it shows in the imagery. Um, that we're there doing it with them. We're, you know, not only preaching, but we're practicing. And um, it's just a fantastic kind of a, you know, dogma to follow. And uh, that's why I jumped on board and extremely happy uh, to be photographing a good portion of uh, these issues. And um, I think they're important issues to highlight because a lot of people don't see the back of the house and don't see, you know, um, where their honey comes from. And don't see these things and see that they're tangible, real things that they can do themselves. And um, the words with the image, I think, uh, is pretty powerful. Anybody else? <laughs> um, can you talk just a little bit about the different kinds of articles that are actually in the issue, um, to sort of just be a little bit more specific to give people a sense of, um, well, what you're looking for for one thing. Um, sure. Yeah. Can I do like the presidential debates and just ask, answer a different question Absolutely. that you didn't even ask? <laughs> Great question. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that Brian said. Um, <laughs> um, about, I'll come back to that later with you. Um, you were talking about, and I'm, I'm going to forget the exact thing, but I, I kind of wanted to talk about um, Okay, I wanted to confess that I have an ulterior motive in, um, and perhaps you share it with me, um, in these publications, which is to change people's eating habits. I talked a little bit about this when I first um, spoke into this microphone. Um, but I, I came to Edible from a not-for-profit background. I came from the green market which is it's a not-for-profit. It advocates for a particular kind of sustainable food system. And I saw a lot of communication that I thought was not very persuasive, that was dire, um, that was single space with no images, <laughs> um, that was unengaging, and uh, overall was ineffective in terms of um, preaching to anybody other than the choir. So why don't you use the word preach? Um, I, I, in in creating these issues, a, a main objective of mine is to cloak that core in a very heavy um, cloak coating of um, really engaging, enjoyable, and pleasurable experience on the part of the reader. So you reference our donut story. Um, I want the magazines to be fun. I want them to be delicious. Um, sure, sometimes we'll have some heavy content in there, and your um, and your water feature got into um, some serious ecology. But within that, we talk about fine restaurants, and you have some really funny quotes, and. Um, I see my role as the editor in really balancing. You know, I don't ever want to be all fluff. I don't just, you know, there's a ton of that out there. And to be honest, it's not that interesting for me. Um, it might sell, but I think it's kind of empty. And I think the balance for me as the editor of these, of these two, of Edible Manhattan and Edible Brooklyn, I think it's pretty consistent um, sought-after balance among the edibles is to take that kind of serious content um, and to make it um, delicious to read for a, a pretty mass audience and not to come out and say 
catastrophe, extinction, destruction, um, horrible news um, that exists in the world. And um, we want, you know, I think the re you talked about how the magazines go extinct, to use the positive version of the word extinct, so fast. No matter how many we print, they get snapped up. Um, and I think that those, our, our readership in a way, I think, is so strong because that balance is there. Do you guys have opinions on that? or? Well, I mean, we are a different type of publication for exactly the reasons you said. We compare ourselves to the gastro-glossies, which, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of, those are also quite enjoyable, but they put food on a pedestal, and a photo essay about some interesting <laughs> ethnic food culture in a remote part of Vietnam is again quite interesting for you know if you're inter if you know as part of you know adding to your culinary knowledge and culinary history, but you can't actually reach out and touch it. I mean, most people are not going to get on a plane and go there and go try that food and support those people. And our goal is uh, by using the means that Gabrielle <coughs> described in encouraging people to go out and touch it. Yeah. Um, and you're, you were starting by talking about your ulterior motive. Right. You know, that is that, you know, we have a bigger interest in being boosters of local food, uh, being boosters of supporting the small businesses that are, um, that are holding on to food traditions. We're not simply interested in writing about those sorts of issues. And um, uh, we realize that, especially in a place like Manhattan or Brooklyn, there are flavors coming from all over the world. But we're really intrigued when a sushi chef... Um, in the East Village uh, isn't happy with the wasabi that he can get his hands on and starts buying horseradish at the green markets and using shark skin to make his own wasabi. Um, you know, that's a great edible story. Or um, uh, you know, the, the, a, a chef uh, like Jock at Palo Santo in Park Slope who's celebrating Latin cuisine, maybe better than anyone else in the city, but doing it in Park Slope, Brooklyn and translated for uh, uh, his, his Brooklyn customers. Uh, and, and, you know, we had a wonderful back-of-the-house photo essay about that place in the last issue or two of Edible Brooklyn. And so you know, we're different from magazines in that way, that, that um, our, our interest is in getting, people interest, uh, in getting people engaged and then sort of selling them on a larger lifestyle, right. you know, sort of changing their values around food. And reading more about food is just one part of that, but taking your food decisions more seriously is another part of it. Which I hope is an outcome for the reader, yeah. But we don't want to hit them over the head Right, with that. I don't um, want to hit them over the head, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah actually, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. Please, to that. I'll try to answer it. <laughs> um, I guess, so if you um, don't want to write something dogmatic, right. um, what are the effective techniques that you use? I mean, since this is a writing program. Great. Um, what do I look for in, what do you in look actually for? editing? Yeah. <laughs> and photography, too. What do you... Well, photography is maybe the first thing you have to add to that mm. mix. I mean, it, on, in the book On Writing Well, and one of the chapters is about photos, and uh, the... Um, who is it? Zinger? Zinser. Zinser. Zinser, William, William Zinser. Which is a great book. I have it on my he shelf. And who does? <laughs> uh, um, he says that there's nothing more valuable than a writer who can also take photos. I mean, that's, you know, writes a thousand words each, you know, with each photo right there. So um, good photography is, I think, a huge part of our package. But I don't know about the writing techniques. Specifics? I mean, you know, not veering into abstractions and yeah. platitudes? I find a lot, I've been so lucky to have such um, wonderful and willing freelancers at my um, uh, fingertips, um, really terrific writers who've been willing to, to write for us for less than they make at um, bigger publications. And I find that a lot of the time, my, the first time a writer submits something, the first time they write for me, uh, my, my response usually <laughs> includes the word sass. I'm like, you got to turn it up, you know. We got to turn up the energy. I want more puns. I want. I mean, maybe that would be maybe that would be considered bad writing. <laughs> but um, I, I think if you if you read the magazine, you get a sense of what I'm looking for. But I want um, punch and wit and zings and um, and something that demonstrates research. I mean, citing history, citing yeah. old books. Well, I think that's the um thing that kind of... Well, but without, least, without like, 30 end notes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I so. hope to at least tie it with, with imagery um, that there's a great, I think, etymology to the magazine itself that you don't walk away from an article just saying, oh, I'm going to go there and try that 
you're going to say, I'm going to go there, try that, dissect it, deconstruct it, and try to make it myself, that you really have a ground, uh, you have a basis for everything that you read. I mean, you, you can figure it out how to make these donuts at home. Um, you want to go there, meet the man, uh, uh, you know, see what the benchmark is and try to attain that. But I think it has something to say with the imagery as well. I'm trying to make it as archival as possible. Um, trying to, well, show ethnicity. Um, there, I mean, you can be ethnographic without having to go to Vietnam because there's plenty right. of like amazing Vietnamese right. food and culture here. Um, but trying to tie those two things in the, uh, together, so show history, you know, show zeitgeist, show things are happening here, and uh, yeah. show that it's not necessarily like ephemeral, temporal, fleeting. That you know, it's not, a, you know, it, it's constantly occurring. It's not like happenstance that we find all these things that, you know, people constantly say, oh, I heard this, oh, I heard that, I heard this, and people have been doing this in New York for ages upon ages, and I think that's what's great about the article, in that it, it says that this has been happening for so long, and we're only now getting the speed. I mean, uh, prior to this, everything's been, you know, import this or hot that, and now it's like, um, well, for 20 years, for 40 years, my grandmother did this, passed it down generations, and it took us this long to realize that, you know, it was right under our noses. Yeah. I'm trying to think more about the writing. Well, you, you also are an editor for Edible East Stand. You want to talk about... Well, I mean, we try to vary the length of stories. There are different readers. There are readers who want a one-pager, and even a short one-pager, 150 words, and a long one-pager, 500 words. My water piece was almost 7,000 words. Um, Fewer people probably got through my water piece than who read our, what we call our front-of-the-book pieces, which are these... You know, short pieces, notable edibles with a big photo. It's sort of just to get you interested. Hopefully there's some word on the page, some caption right across from the nice Eileen Fisher ad, um, which I should talk a little bit about is sort of our business model um, and who we attract because we do not attract the same advertisers as most publications. Um, but I, I think varying story length is one thing, and the shorter stories are going to be lighter. This is fairly mm -hmm. traditional magazine publishing right. stuff. Front, of book, yeah. Front of book is lighter. Back of book is also lighter. You know, sort of the last page is always something a little memorable. And in the, in the center, you put the longer pieces, the more thoughtful pieces that people really have to get into. Um, and then briefly, before Gabrielle talks more about style, you know, we are a niche publication to a large extent. A lot of uh, newspapers and magazines are dropping in circulation really rapidly. Our circulation grows with every issue. We're printing 100,000 edible Manhattans uh, six times a year, 40,000 edible East Ends <coughs> and edible Brooklyns. We started out printing 7,000 edible East Ends a few years ago. So our circulation's gone up uh, almost sixfold in just four years. And um, we're, not, we're not in a position right now to print a million copies. And we're not necessarily going to be as widely read as some of the other excellent food writing in the city that happens in the New York Times, and the New Yorker, or even Savoir magazine, which has a bigger circulation than us. Uh, but we get into the hands of who we consider food influencers. You know, we drop off a box at Gramercy Tavern or Blue Hill, both of which request the magazine, and they're gone immediately. Their staff takes it, and they want another box for the staff that didn't get it that day. So we're interested in our a targeted readership, food professionals, food decision makers in the city, people who shop at the green markets, uh, and, beyond, and, and then slowly moving beyond that fringe, uh, which is a big fringe, uh, towards those people who are just getting interested or those people who could care less about food but are really interested in Brooklyn or really interested in culture in Manhattan and they see food as a component. So we are a grassroots niche publication. We have a lot lower overhead uh, than a typical publishing house, um, but we also you know, have less revenue than a typical publishing house. Um, and uh, we attract different advertisers. It's worth mentioning. It's a lot of local advertisers. Slowly, especially in the bigger markets, national advertisers are becoming interested, like Eileen Fisher, which, you know, who would thought a, a you know, women's clothing company would be interested in advertising? But they have a very values-based corporate mission. And their corporate headquarters in Livingston on the Hudson uh, has an incredible cafeteria, and they invest a ton of money into the food that they serve their 200 staff at that place. So uh, they ally with us um, on, on, that, uh, on, on that side. Uh, Gabrielle knows someone at the company. They read Edible Brooklyn voraciously. They want, wanted to see Edible Manhattan, and they are interested in being a supporter of the magazine. So you know, to talk more about the dollars and cents side, um, 
we are as interested in getting our advertisers to understand the mission as, as anyone else. And when it's a big national food company that gets interested, hopefully uh, we will then teach them something about food as well. There are some advertisers we would not accept, obviously. You know, the American Pork Council, we probably, who is, you know, still a sort of a, a, you know, a bastion of supporting horrible factory farming, we would not accept an ad from. McDonald's, we would not accept an ad from. If General Mills wanted to advertise the fact that they give out more, uh, more uh, food aid in the United States than any other company, that might be an interesting ad. But we're not interested in an ad from them or for, from Kraft or someone else just selling horrible, uh, horrible food that's anonymous and has no story behind it. So that also separates us from a New Yorker or a New York Times because we will say no to certain advertisers. Um, I just want to think about your question about writing. Um, I was actually going to use the example of captions. I noticed um, after editing a few of these and producing a few of these, I started to p notice in a new way how I read other magazines. And I realized that I always read all the ca like I'll pay through the whole magazine and read all the captions. So um, I feel kind of embarrassed to name these two because they're so silly. But here are two examples of captions that we put in to kind of raise the energy level. So um, in, in Brian's sort of serious story about... Um, our, our tap water, which has a, a lot of, of really great history, to balance kind of the, the you know, heaviness of the subject in, in this, you know, 19th century photo of this 5,000 pound pipe or whatever, we put the caption as heavy metal and then said what it is. Or um, hydro, bandwidth. hydro bandwidth, yeah. Kind of being, I don't want to say silly, but trying to have fun and not make people feel like this is some, this is like doing my homework, you know. This is, um, we had, oh, breaking out in hives as the caption for one of our um, pictures in the hives story. So I, I, I will admit I like puns. I love alliteration. I should probably get um, bad crates in here from <laughs> writing classes for that reason. Also, the but, fridge department is all fun in some yeah. ways. Yeah. We have um, a section called the, well, originally it was called the Brooklyn Fridge because it rhymes with Brooklyn Bridge. In which we, it's it's all quotes from some sort of prominent Brooklyn or New Yorker about um, what they eat, what's in their fridge, what's in their kitchen. I get a ton of pitches. I get pitched now that the magazines are more prominent. I mean, initially I had um, relationships with. You're laughing about how many pitches. <laughs> um, and initially, my my kind of starting lineup of writers was um, freelancers and New York City food writers that I know. I get so many pitches. And so many of them would run, so many of these stories that I turned down would run just fine in um, a, a kind of more mainstream food publication that's like, oh, the desserts are spotty, but the um, peach pie is really not to be missed. That's just not interesting to me. Um, in part, it's not so much the content, it's the writing. I just am looking for a lot more energy. And for me, if you really know food, that's great. But whether or not you can write is the litmus test. And if somebody sends me clips and says, if, you know, if a writer pitches me and sends me clips and says, I haven't written about food, but I'm really interested in it, and here are my clips, and I'm really sorry, but they're all about reviewing bands or about IT or I wrote for Scientific American. If they're good, I'm like, great, you're on. Here's your assignment because you know how to write, and then you can apply that to, um, to the subject that I'm going to give you. Whereas just a passion for food, it, so often it just, the, the piece I get back, and, I, and then I have to spend so much time editing it, it's still not there. So. <laughs> um, I get the same thing with food photographers and the portfolios. Um, and it's like they've never even looked at the magazine, because uh, I think what also separates us is it's not really commercial photography. It's not soft-focused front, blown-out back. Sorry, I like pigeonhole it like that, but... I get so many commercial photographers sending me their stuff, and I only wish I could light stuff like that, but that's not what we're about. We're about right. being there and not taking time away from the people producing the things that they make. Um, most of the back of the house series, I'll spend a shift, a double, maybe even more, with them in the kitchen during service. Uh, we're premiering one that uh, is coming out next Manhattan issue. I was there at quarter or five in the morning, and I stayed a double shift downstairs in the, base, uh, in the basement with, you know, a hot, humid oven the whole time. And um, you're not going to get many commercial photographers that will be willing to go in someone's space and give up everything. 
and abide by their rules because you had to abide by this this guy's rules. And uh, it, it's just that, you know, we're there, and uh, though we're making a presence on the page, we try to be a fly on the wall while we're writing these articles and photographing them. Yeah, it sounds like you're very interested in um, the documentary aspect of what you do. Do you think the magazine has an interest in that as well? Um, ask in, me more specifically what you uh, think by documentary. Well, sort fly of, on the wall, kind of. Yeah. Um, I think that... Not across the board. The back of the house section, and for those of you who haven't worked in restaurants, that, that's what you call the part that the customer doesn't see. You know, the front of the house is the dining room, the back of the house is the kitchen. I don't know if I, yeah, I want to flesh that out. Um, so by back of the house, and this is why it's not a restaurant review. We don't say, you know, the second time I went in, the cod was overcooked. Um, it's very clear that we're there. Yeah, you want to help it up? Yeah, I mean, and this is the back of the house spread from little from the last the launch issue of Edible Manhattan. This is just one of the spreads um, from Little Giant down on Orchard Street. And um, yeah, these are not shots that would show up in most other publications. Um, not just because they're behind the scenes, but they're not uh, posed and stylized because we are interested in the candid. I mean, that's another principle that I look for in good writing is. Uh, Candidness. I mean, is this person, this writer, going out with a notepad and asking interesting questions to, to get the person that they're interviewing to say something a little off the cuff or maybe to be a little bit more honest or be a, a bit emotional? And uh, that's what happens with our photography as opposed to um, a more po posed food shot. I mean, I'm looking through for examples of things. But, you know, this, this shot of this guy, Knock Waxman, who runs Kitchen Arts and Letters, I mean, him among his books... It's not that posed, um, and it just sort of, it, it says who he is. You know, we didn't look to shoot the side of his face that was most beautiful, or, you know, we, we wanted to get him in his element. And um, that, I'd say, in some ways, that's what separates our photography and our writing, because, you know, we're turned on to stories partly by who we know, and they're not necessarily stories that are going to show up elsewhere. Yeah, they're... Um they're about that kind of authentic or it, it, it doesn't have to be beautiful. And I don't mean that this writing is better. Oh, it looks like somebody has a question. I just want to ask a quick question since I am formerly in the restaurant industry and I'm working on becoming a writer and I have been published previously. Did any of you have any food, professional food background in any way? Meaning in a kitchen? Yeah. I think Michael. Michael. Yeah, yeah, Michael. I've been, I've been in kitchens. Do? Um, many, many a jobs from being a butcher. Uh, I was a poissonier. Um, you know, I did garmanger jay for a little. I was a fishmonger. Uh, I butchered when I was a vegetarian. Um, wow. Yeah, across the board. I liked all the... Yeah, but I... Um, yeah, <laughs> but very much just, I just enjoyed the grit and the raw skill. So I wasn't necessarily a guy that you'd say uh, you'd build a restaurant around or even call a sous chef because... It's too frenetic, and I kind of freelance in the sense. I, and I, uh, when I was working in Boston, I learned as many people's menus as possible. And I said, "Give me a call up if you ever need anything." And they did. And I just jumped in, and just it was all about you know uh, the techniques for me. And that's what I kind of gathered. So, oh yeah, very much so. So I mean, that's what's helped me in uh, this photography. Well, I think one, I know how to get the hell out of the way. <laughs> um, uh, and two, I just there's a different angle when you're photographing uh, food. Knowing food, knowing preparation, you know, uh, knowing you know how to how things are broken down, um, you know, seeing a fish carved or seeing you know a saddle carved, you just know what people are looking for. So I think it really helped in that aspect. Oh yeah. And here's a spread about the donut plant, which is a beautiful article. And you know, it's more process that we're interested in than just the post picture of the baker himself or herself. Yeah. That's Mark. Yeah. Right. But he's actually doing something. You know, he's just not just sitting at a desk posing for the photo. So, I have not worked in restaurants. Um, I staged for a week. I, I've never been to culinary school. Um, I staged for a week at Chez Panisse just because that was interesting to me. And I staged at Blue Hill just because I have a relationship there. But um, my real field experience is really in the in the field fields of farmers. Um, I was at Green Market for eight years, and I also farmed um, up in the Catskills. So. We, th that's kind of my on the ground um, experience. We cover some restaurants. I guess we're talking a lot about restaurants, but it's really one feature. It's a pretty small slice of each um, article. 
and um, issue. cover letter. Yeah. Oh, sorry, each issue. Yeah. And um, so, so no, I, I haven't worked in a restaurant. I, I have. I don't have any restaurant experience. Uh, Stephen Munchen, who's the publisher of these three magazines with me, has a ton of New York City <coughs> and East End restaurant experience, and that's been invaluable. Uh, not just because he's able to get access to places and speaks the lingo, uh, but for me personally to learn. And I have more experience with the farming side as well. And for us, restaurant is not our beat. Food is our beat. And I think all three of us have a lot of food experience background. Um, Michael's only more with restaurant background. But, I mean, your knowledge is very appropriate. I came mostly from the environmental field. I uh, Work still work, uh, but not as much, for the World Watch Institute, a think tank in Washington, D.C., where I write about food from an, for an environmental organization. So I was interested in environmental journalism, got into food writing because it was a great way to get people interested in what was happening to their water supply or the diversity of crop species on the planet or thinking about uh, bigger issues like climate change. Um, but I, I don't have, I, I'm sorely inadequate in back-of-the-house experience. You know, the the only other big advice I'd say in terms of the writing style is when I get a story sent to me, if it's well written, often the only comment I'll send back to the writer, something that I'd like them to add, is, you know, this is great. You've done this great interview with this peach farmer on the North Fork of Long Island and how they're struggling because costs are going up and people don't make peach pies the way they used to and people only buy a few here. There are no families who show up and buy two or three bushels of peaches at a time, and there's great history here, there's great quotes, but put it in the bigger context. Uh, and, and that means, you know, put this one farmer's story or struggle in the context of what's happening to farmers all throughout the United States or all throughout the world, because uh, to me, that not, not as a reader, it draws me in, but it also makes me take it ser- more seriously, because I uh, see it connected to something, um, something much larger And all the Edible Communities magazines, to some extent, struggle and try to do that, whether you're publishing in a tiny town in Iowa, uh, but you can make the story of this person trying to make salami from uh, her own pigs uh, part of this bigger movement of people making um, artisanal charcuterie in cities and small towns all around the country. So, uh, again, in the interest of getting people uh, to spend more time thinking and reading about food, um, it's our challenge to, um, you know, to to make them feel like if they don't read about this, they're going to be missing out on something very large. We're sort of, you know, they're becoming part of our community. They're becoming insiders just by reading the magazine. Mm-hmm. Something else that comes to mind in terms of changing the writing or my work as an editor, um, early on, um, I think I was pretty negative with my writers. I would say... Um, you know, this part really didn't work for me, and I thought that um, you, you really lost me here, and I think that this part really needs to be rewritten. And um, there was a conspicuous absence of stroking, <laughs> um, just because I wanted to emphasize what I needed. And um, uh, in talking to another editor who had been at The New Yorker, um, she said, you know, I learned how much more motivated your writer is to change their writing um, when you um, surround that with a bunch of positive things. She's like, when I get a story that I just hate, I'll say like, oh my gosh, that first sentence. This is, this is me quoting this other editor. That first sentence was just so powerful. Now the entire rest of it needs to be rewritten. But man, that first sentence. <laughs> and um, I think it, I think it, it does work. I mean, that's, I guess, more about human psychology in general, but um, <laughs> I had to learn it. Um, and I, I think that it makes the pos- it makes the writer more motivated to, to, you know, dive back in and rewrite that 1,500 words because I just said that this story is has really great cover story potential or whatever, you know, in case that's relevant. Yeah. Any other editorial tricks? Nope. I mean, you kind of have to get into an uncomfortable position sometimes to get a good photo. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I initially got out of the kitchen um, because I blew out both my ACLs. um, And I just couldn't be on my feet that long anymore. Photography really has not helped that injury. um, And sometimes I only wish people are taking photographs of me while I'm photographing. (laughs) Because I'm just in the most awkward of positions. Um, And now mainly abutted up against fryers and, you know, combi ovens and 
You know, um, my clothes are not the cleanest anymore. Um, I used to be able to wear whites to protect, but now, uh, you know, I'm splattering food all over the place. But it's, it's definitely um, make yourself uncomfortably real, you know. Uh, put yourselves in the positions that the other people are in uh, to photograph and, at, you know, to write as well. And I think that gets the truer story. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't mind, you know, bending over backwards to get the right image. I also think in terms of evaluating the quality of a piece, I've found that the last line is the most important line, and it, it can make or break a piece. If I have, a, if I have like a, a B piece with, with a, ends on a whimper, I don't know if I can run it, and a B piece that like has an A-plus last line, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this piece is like my favorite piece in the magazine. So I think that that last line is the, probably the hardest line in this piece to write, and um, for me the most important. Although writers might not, I mean, readers might not get there, but that's, that's how I judge the pieces on the last line. Um, we actually, um, Alma has just brought up two boxes of the latest uh, Edible Manhattan that some people have, but the latest Edible Brooklyn just came out today. So it's got an amazing uh, photo essay of food tattoos that Michael did, including on the cover. And the only, uh, you know, nuts and bolts thing that is also worth mentioning, because I'm thinking of what is the advice that I often give to writers is people should not, it can't, writers, including myself, struggle to cut their pieces down to size. Yeah. I mean, a thousand word piece cut from a two thousand word piece is always a better piece. I mean, if you have the space, yeah. that's one thing. But, you know, I've heard it said as, you know, drown your puppies or murder your darlings. Murder your darlings. Yeah. You know, there's, there's always way too much. Uh, a, a ratio of one to ten comes to mind. I've heard lots of journalism professors and majors say that, that for every 10 good quotes you get, only one is going to show up in the article. And often it's, it's sort of you know, a crapshoot. Uh, you could write a good story around any one of those 10 quotes, and I think writers who pump out stuff, work at newspapers, and write three or four stories a day understand that, that you've just you got to get the story out because then you can work on another story. And you know, we agonize about the magazine in this first issue of Edible Manhattan I don't know how many times uh, Michael was in an awkward position, you know, getting the cover shot, assorted cover shots. We just didn't know what to do because we needed to make a statement. And um, we finally realized, I think you said it to me when we were down at the seaport, um, let's start talking about issue two because, you know, we're spending a lot of energy on issue one and we're interested in publishing these magazines and documenting this for a very long time. So right. don't be afraid to move on from your piece and cut whole paragraphs and right. cut that lead that cut. you thought was yeah. so good that you worked on for Get three days. I even think with the, the B piece, um, I must have been on about five different roofs uh, photographing tons oh. and tons of different... I, don't, I think I had one photo in that yeah. whole thing. We got photos from other people. Stephen took one and another. Um, I also right. realize I hate bees like, <laughs> extremely, and they'd be in their bee uniforms, and I'd go, where's mine? And they say... Where's your what? <laughs> and they'd be handling them, and they'd be hitting my lens. And but you know, you're there to get it. You're there to get the story. You're there to experience this, no matter how much you hate bees. Um, but yeah, and at a point, we had it, and we just said that's enough, and uh, we moved on. I really have to agree with what Brian said about improving a piece by cutting it. Um, I think that's um, my 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 main tool is the knife um, to, to to take a piece. Even if I would love to run this piece over four pages or five pages, um, but to, it, it's kind of like reducing. It's like making a reduction. But just going through, control. it's like, <laughs> but I mean, it's like cooking it down. It's like, this is kind of watery. I can make this more intense. And I don't mean, uh, certainly sometimes it's like, I'm going to cut this whole paragraph. I'm going to cut this whole section. But m I think more often in terms of just taking a piece that's good, and making it better, it's like going through line by line and being like, okay, I can make this four-word phrase into two words. I can just make it denser, make it tighter. Um, and then overall, the piece packs a punch. I find that's one of my biggest criticisms um, is that it just it, it feels watery to me. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean by watery? And it takes time. I have a contributor on the East End who's a winemaker, and he's studying to get his Master of Wine, which is actually this obscure, very uh, hard-to-get degree that only 250, uh, 250 people in the world have. And you have to be nominated by a current Master of Wine. And writing is part of their training. 
And he doesn't have a ton of writing experience, but he's theatrical, he was a performance artist, so he understands what good writing is, and he's done a ton of reading, so he's got a head start. But all when he sends me his pieces, I cut him in half, and we go back and forth a million times, and he's holding on to every single word, and finally he agrees and understands that, huh, that piece before was just way too long. And it's all, you know, you can say all the same in 300 words as 600 words. Um, I'll also just point out, in terms of making the magazine compelling, we have started experimenting with illustrations, and Abby Denson, our, one of our, our only illustrator, is here tonight, and she did... Uh, she has some great illustrations that will be coming out in the next issue of Edible Manhattan, but she also did the illustration in the Dan article. I think it was, was it farther forward? Um, th- that Dan Barber wrote about the cheese plate at Blue Hill. So um, I'll find that and hold it up for you. But again, it's just something interesting that people can look at. And, and um, graphic, uh, graphic novels and graphic journalism, uh, cartooning is becoming uh, much more a part of our... Um, of our writing landscape, and it's really interesting. And sometimes you can convey in an illustration. Um, Abby tells a story of uh, food going from Long Island Farms to this distributor to supermarkets in New York City in a really interesting illustration that will be running in the next Edible Manhattan. There's Abby there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I'm nice to meet you. I have a few questions in terms of, uh, but I, I really appreciate the, when I first came upon Edible uh, Brooklyn on uh, Atlantic Avenue, and I thought it was really a beautiful and uh, there's a humanity and a dignity, I don't know what other words, but, and also that it was free, it was a little bit jarring. It's got to be a catch. And, and one thing was very well put together and, and a surprise, you know, and, and, and you pick beautiful topics, vendors, and Marshall Market, and Red Hook, and not just you know, uh, one would think would just be like Smith Street or, right. know, or Atlantic uh, Avenue. I have, uh, I guess, my two questions. One, um, are you looking to look at, for example, when you cross the border, do you go to Queens, for example, or that's like, you, because it's that over there? Enemy territory. I mean, would there be an edible Queens? It just seems like that's another international, you know, and I, yeah. you don't want to, like, uh, spread out too thin, but I'm just curious about that. And also, if, uh, how much of this, I guess template uh, is uh, you know, is yours and, and it's universal. Like, like, just hearing you speak about your approach to this, is it very unique relative to other? Uh, I don't know, let's say the old high. I think you mentioned that's the first one. Yeah. But so in, in, uh, in terms of your uh, advertisers and, and using photography and all that, I'll give a quick answer to both of those and let Brian give a longer answer. About Queens, people ask me all the time about Queens. I say, I sure hope so because I would love to read it. I'm not qualified to edit it, but I would love to read Edible Queens. Um, and about, do we have the same um, similar approach? There are, there are how many, 40 Edibles now? Uh, almost 50 now, oh. and dozens more signed up in various stages. I think, yes, I think we um, really have a similar philosophy and approach. Each one is unique. Each one is independently created. Um, we, we attended, well, Brian's been to many. I've been to one meeting with all the um, publishers and editors, and we ha- I thought we had a huge amount in common in terms of um, passion and opinion, um, but each each one has its own flavor. But, but Brian doesn't want to go varying those And varying topics. levels of experience as well. Right. I mean, we're in a very sophisticated market, on, uh, really, from the East End to Manhattan. There are lots of people in the publishing business um, uh, we can't really uh, afford to have bad photography or bad writing. Uh, and around the country, some of the other edibles are founded by people who have the passion but don't necessarily have the experience. And they end up learning a lot on the job. And you'll pick it up and you'll recognize it as part of this network, but it might look more like a newsletter. Or uh, they will not have many uh, incredible, compelling photos. And that's all right because those magazines are still gobbled up because no one else is telling that story. Now, can they improve and do they improve all the time? Uh, And partly as the business begins to work for them. Uh, We have no plans to do an Edible Queens or Bronx or Staten Island. 
although we have talked a lot, and I would really love us to have an outer boroughs department where we tell the interesting mm -hmm. Queen story in Manhattan and Brooklyn because people want to know that. And we are going to do a story on the Queens County Farm. Yeah, the right? worth, worth the trip kind of angle. But yeah, yeah. there will be other stories. Point mark, right. right. And that's so re it's not just a Bronx story. Hunts Point is so relevant to any borough. And it is or, for instance, you can tell it through someone else, uh, the chef yeah. at Esca, Dave Pasternak, who... Uh, you know, uh, is perhaps the best seafood chef in the in the city, uh, and uh, lived at the Fulton Fulton Street Market, and was sad to see it move up to Hunts Point, but still goes there because he wants to see the fishers. And that would come up in a story that we write about him, and we have talked to him about that sort of thing. And the seaport's history is involved in Hunts Point, so yeah, I don't think we're that competitive. Brooklyn and Manhattan had very clear identities, and they had interested readers interested subscribers, advertisers, people who want to support the magazine. These magazines are sort of bubble up when there's a groundswell. Um, there's no doubt an edible Queens out there, but um, it hasn't uh, demanded itself yet. I also think in terms of variation among the different edibles, my, and, and this brings up something else that I think is interesting, my readership in Brooklyn, like I have to be sassy and snappy because it's like a bunch of 27-year-olds in Williamsburg who are my readership. Um, and that's not, it's not a bunch of hipsters who are the readership of Edible Iowa River Valley. So each one has to have its own unique tone. And truthfully, I'll have a different voice already I do in Edible Manhattan than I do in Edible Brooklyn, even though I edit both of them, but I have to edit them differently to, to respect that I have a different readership. You know, I only go to Smith Street, like you were saying. Go to to, you know, go to Coney Island. Um, but I also know that's not primarily my readership. We probably have time for Sorry. one more question. Uh, one of the things I love in magazines is letters to the editor. Yeah. Do you spam it at all? Would you like to write me a letter? <laughs> yeah. I'll publish it. It does not affect you publish. I also love letters to the editor. Um, even when they criticize, I think they're. I, I love to read them in other magazines, and I love to publish them absolutely. And we have, um, in our first one, we didn't have any yet. Um, <laughs> nobody had written to me yet. But yes, we're, we we do publish them. In I, think, I think I have to write one actually. Bring it on. Well, no, because I almost got beat up by a whole gang of Chinese women trying to collect ginkgo berries. So, uh, well, yes, we talked about that. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So. That well, I think good. I need it tonight, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Oh, kind of that. Carmen, you should let him beat you up. Uh huh. Uh huh. That'd be good for me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me.